Now, I usually, usually give the example of the Francisco Caracola class as the ultimate class of what might have happened if these had been built. Honestly, they have so many options for what they would have done. Frankly, it's, you know, it's an amazing possibility of how that would have affected history if the Francisco Caracolas had been created. However, there is another class. There is the class that in many ways the Francisco Caracolas are responses to. Because let's be honest, the when I put the Italians in the qualitative race, of the dreadnought race along with the Japanese along with the Americans and the Brits I'm missing out of power now the Italians always have to build more because the Italians are worried about both the French and this power but it is the other power not the French which push forward the Italians the Italians are in sort of in them in their own sort of version of Britain in that case and that they've got a qualitative race with one nation and they've got a quantitative race with another one Britain has a qualitative race with the whole world and a quantitative race with Germany Italy has a quantitative race with France and a qualitative race with Austria-Hungary and the Urza Monarch class, which were going to be 21 knot ships, not the world's fastest ships, and definitely, but decent, solid dreadnought ships, that were going to be armed with 10 14 inch guns. These were a qualitative jump. They were the successors to the Tegatov class, and the Tegatov class are powerful enough ships. When you look at them, when you see something with 12, 12 inch guns in four triple turrets, you very quickly realize you are talking about a very powerful warship. That is a warship which, in terms of the. Uh, in terms of the German and the Austrians and the. The Ottomans in World War II, One was probably the most powerful battleship individually. They had most of the war in their numbers, because whilst you did have others like Ben come in, etc., which had 15-inch guns, yeah, 12, 12-inch 12 guns. That's a a hefty load of firepower. That really is a hefty load of firepower. The Azat Monarchs would have been 10, 14 inch guns. The thing is, that's an increase in firepower again, because the old, the old rule of thumb we use is if you go up 2 inches, you go up a level, you drop down a gun per turret, and that equates to roughly about the same in terms of firepower. So, in 14 inch gun terminology, Eight would have been the equivalent. She's got ten. They've got the same firepower as the King George V in World War Two would have. Yes, they're only twenty-one knot ships. But with the Tegatovs, he has that monarchs. Would have been eight battleships that the Italians had to be very careful about because there would have been eight battleships which would have been a solid solid fist in the Adriatic they don't have to be long range they don't have to be even particularly massively fast those are going to be eight solid ships fighting in confined waters where well, you can't dodge them where well, you can't really outmaneuver them and that's already another reason why the Italians are going with the Francisco Caracolas as the response, because they need this faster ships because they need to be able to cover all their sides. They need to be able to cover the Adriatic, the Ionian, and the Tyrrhenian Sea, i.e. all the seas around them in the Mediterranean. They need to be able to cover all these areas to protect themselves. 
And that means with the French as the quantitative threat, i.e. the new and not equivalent numbers. They have to be able to show they have a superiority numbers to deal the French, but they also have to be sure they have enough quality to deal with the Austrians. Because honestly, your first generation Italian dreadnought is probably not gonna have fun versus a Tegatov. Definitely not an Urza mark. Definitely not. Shameless book plug. Finally thought I'd bring it in, but yes. And that's the other thing you have to consider about the Austrians. They produce a surprisingly, beautifully balanced fleet in many ways. This is again a difference. As you will note from previous videos when I've talked about the German high seas fleet. In order to build the dreadnoughts to build the ships they need, the, you know, the headline acts. They gut their cruiser force. They do not produce anywhere near enough cruisers. They do not build anywhere near enough of the intermediary ships. And that's a really big thing. Once you put the two fleets again, if you go to the video which is the fleets of Jutland, you'll see there's a huge disparity. More than just the whole stats thing, huge disparity between those forces which are coming along as part of the wider Grand Fleet and those forces which are part of the wider High Seas Fleet. And this is a goal all down to, again, the infrastructure scenario of Britain and America and all those, the larger infrastructure base they have. It's like, again, when we're talking about the from World War II, you can talk about the numbers of battleships which are being built. You can talk about the number of battleships which are being reconditioned. The aircraft carriers being built. The aircraft carriers which are re being reconditioned. All those things. The work that's going on. And you can use those as the headline acts and compare them. But then you have to also look down below. I.e. number of destroyers being built. Number of destroyers being reconditioned. Number of cruisers being built. Cruisers being reconditioned. All the things going on below that. And... The disparity just grows once you're looking at these forces below the headline acts. Because often, nations will put a lot of money into the headliners. Why? Because that's their status. That's what you see in the news. However, just the Hungarian fleet, they are balanced. This is, of course, is a take it off. They are no, they don't have an endless supply of cruisers, an endless supply of torpedo boats and submarines and all those things. But in proportion to their size, they put in them in, so that they have enough scouting assets. They have enough smaller assets to do the duty the smaller assets are required to do to allow the bigger, larger assets to do what they need to do. There's a case of, we can't afford to build as big a fleet as we would like in terms of headline assets. But it's better to have good quality assets and make sure we have a properly proportioned fleet around those assets so we can make the fullest use of them than it is to just seek out these purely for ego. If you consider today, with modern budgetary battles and squabbles, the amount of money which doesn't get spent on maintenance of things like educate and military educational facilities. That's come up recently in the news in the UK. Turns out all our centres of officer training have been completely ignored when it comes to spending on them, and they're all heritage-listed buildings. Fun. The trouble is, this isn't a new problem. It's very easy to make the case for a headline act. It is 
very easy to make the case for something which is of obvious value because it is the status, it is the capital asset, it is the thing which, I don't know, is your ballistic missile submarine, it's your aircraft carrier, it's your big hulking dreadnought with massive guns. It is the symbol of national pride and status as a world power. As a regional power. As a great power. It is everything. And yet. Try making the case against the same forces in the same room for all the escorts and ships you need to go around it. Nope. That is when you get all sorts of wonderful ideas put forward of, oh, but it'll be, uh, there will get some allies to provide ships, and we'll get this to provide ships, and that to provide ships, or, well, we're going to go for a synergistic, joined-up force structure, which is going to be able to utilize different assets from different hulls and integrate them into one battle sphere, which will all work. Which all sounds great, as long as it works. But the trouble is, that's putting all your eggs in a, in a very fragile basket. There is no point building something and not having the ability to use it and use it properly. There is no point having a powerful core of your battle fleet and not having the ability to use it. Now you can argue if you look at the Austro-Hungarian position here, why are they having dreadnoughts in the first place? Why do they have these big ships. After all, it's just a small amount of water, and then the Adriatic is, you know, the Italians dominate it. They have the coast all the way from its north to its south is Italian. Well, there are three good reasons to have a battle fleet. One, if you can dominate the Adriatic Sea from your position, and if you have a battle fleet, you can in this period. Especially if you can dominate it in a southerly position, or even from the northerly position, you can a stop the Italians being able to move goods up and down their coast, which in an era when you consider the mountains, especially across Italy, and an era where road travel is not really the most viable way of moving goods, there aren't really enough railways going north and south of Italy to take all of those they need to, you are going to make their life a lot more difficult if they can't, use ship it, they can't move shipping up and down this coast. So that's a good reason to have a battle fleet. Because if you don't have one, a battle fleet to dom uh, ability to dominate that, the Italian battle fleet, which they will most certainly have, well, that will soon be able to dominate it. Then you've got the fleet in being security scenario. You've got a lot of coast to defend yourself in that area. Some of those are critical, critical areas for you and your industry. Critical areas for your ability to be a major power. You need to protect them. And final reason is look at all this area. The Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Two Crowns, whatever you want to call it, is, as it's put up there, many nations. A strong navy is a good reason to build, uh, to act, well, is a good thing to build up. 
because it acts as a melting pot. It acts as something which allows you to bring together those nations, bring together the people within them, and get them to work together. Navies, especially in periods before the ease of global travel was jumping on a plane, were exciting things. They were opportunities for people who were poor, but able to advance, but also for people to be able to see the world, to go off around the world. And for the Austro-Hungarians, it brought together lots of different parts of their empire together, to work together, to forge bonds. So instead of the people becoming, oh, you know, I'm trying to think of a group here who won't be too upset with me talking, oh, those Slovakians, you know, instead of being a random sort of stereotype or whatever you imagine the Slovakians are, if you're a Hungarian, they, that would be, well, I, yeah, my friend, Big G. Slovakian. Ah, oh, he was great on the ship. Seriously. You should see how much he could drink. Yeah. This sounds... Kind of strange today. But navies were a very multicultural organization. They always were. They brought together a lot of people from different parts of society, from the different spread of society, and made them work together. And they couldn't get away from each other. There wasn't the same stratification you could have in the army. Why? Because, believe it or not, in the army, if you want to get away from people, you can walk away from them. And you can get away. In the army, when you turn up, usually you have some sort of space to go. And you're only fighting a war, only really in front of your life, when there is actually a war on. Occasionally accidents happen in training and those things, which we always hope to avoid, but, you know, those things happen. But that's not really fighting for your life. Ships, on the other hand, have a habit of ending up in places where the sea, which they constantly is just there, it's the occupational hazard of being on a ship, really, is trying to kill you. Mother Nature is trying to kill you. And the only chance you have of surviving it is if everyone on that ship works together. It forges something. It really does. So, they want a fleet. But this also explains to an extent why the Francisco Caracolas are fast and why the Tegados and the Ezzet Monarchs aren't. They are 20, 21 knot ships. Why? Because speed isn't going to help the Austrians here. Speed, there is... There is no room to maneuver with speed here. It's one of the things about speed is it's it's a great it's a great tool for maneuvering as long as you have space to maneuver. Whenever someone tells you speed is life, that's great, but that means they have room to use that speed. If you want to stop, uh, if you if you're facing something that uses speed as its form of movement as its life, you slow it down. You can think about that in several battles where battle cruisers were sunk in World War One and others, where the battle cruiser had to slow down. That's where they run out of life. They can go full speed and keep going full speed. They have life. And it's the same with torpedo boats. It's the same with. Fighters, everything. The only thing which really use 
lack of speed to its advantage is the swordfish, but that's a really weird and special case, and I'm sure all the various aircraft which might have been shot down by swordfish in, in Norway um, were very much cl very clear about claiming they were shot down by Spitfires, not by the swordfish suddenly going so slow they overshot it and then shooting it from behind them. So, first thing to notice, once again, the Austrians are also part, just as the Germans are to an extent, part of the British technological network. It's one of the really interesting things when you look at the dreadnought race, especially the quality part of the dreadnought race, just how much of that race is down to British engineering companies. Again, we like to think these days of the world being uniquely now we're dealing with multinational corporations who are global and it's it's something new and it's something we haven't dealt with before. No. They've been around for a long, long time. Just ask the East India Company, which had bases all around the world for all sorts of reasons. Or rather, as they call them, factories. 24,500 tons, 172 meters long at the waterline, uh, 28.5 meters beam, draft at 8.4 meters, fairly decent. Now, 15 Yarrow boilers, supplying four steam turbine sets, which are an interesting construction, because the, there is a lot of information which basically uh, suggests to me domestic construction of at least British designs were planned for at least one of them. But again, that's nothing unusual. As we've talked about before with the German battle cruisers, the fact is, without the British uh, the British um, turbine designs, the German fleet, the Kaiserlich Marine, wouldn't have had battle cruisers. The cute thing to put there again is that uh, yes, if the British had refused to sell Germany ba uh, turbine parts. A, but Germany probably would have gone shopping from elsewhere, so it probably wouldn't have had much of an impact on that one. But um, there is an argument that uh, that would have delayed their construction of their own, the German battle cruisers by a good few months, if not years. Now, a thousand to eleven hundred officers and men in the crew. Decent. Ten or fourteen inch guns in two triple and two twin turrets. Fourteen five point nine inch guns in casemate. Eight three and a half inch guns. Then it starts getting interesting because you've got uh, two one point nine inch, that's forty seven millimeter guns. But separate to all that, you've got between eight. 12 three and a half inch guns for the AA roll this is an interesting thing to think about because they're again mounted in single mounts again mounted in single mounts so you could theoretically have 20 of those on the vessel And that makes sense again because you're dealing with confined waters and the threat of Italian motor torpedo boats. So you want a lot of, ra lot of rapid fire guns, a lot of rapid fire guns, to deal with that threat and to deal with the threat of potentially of aircraft. And depending on ship, five or six 21 inch torpedo tubes. Now, the belt armor, pretty thick, between five and a half inch and 12.2 inch fist thick, uh, casemates, 5.9 inches. Appropriate, as that is the same thickness, the same as the guns they're firing. Turrets were up to 13.4 inches in thickness at forward, but it went down to roughly 3.1 inches 
at the back and on top. Conning tower, 12.6 inches thickness. Thickest piece of uh, steel on the ship. And deck, 1.4 to 2.8 inches. They're good ships. Now, Rudolf Montecurli had been the person who'd ordered the Tegatovs. And he had ordered the Tegatovs before even really waiting for, it, uh, for permission. His successor was Admiral Anton House. Now, when he took over in February 1913, he was taking over as head of what was the sixth largest navy in Europe, arguably the eighth largest navy in the world, once you add in Japan and America at this time. It was approaching its goal of having 16 battleships, although only four of those were of Dreadnought type. In fact, in Montecurli's latest memorandum to the Emperor Franz Joseph, uh, Joseph in that period, uh, he pointed out that these numbers did include the three 20-year-old battleships of the Monarch class, which were pretty much ironclad coastal defense ships. And about a quarter of the size of the Tegadov class, which is where the name for this class comes from. As that Monarch class means that these were going to be the new Monarch class. Not that that was going to be their name, but that's what we call them. So the names that they were probably going to have are fairly easy to work through. Monarch, Wien and Budapest. Plus a fourth one. It's therefore one of the really sort of interesting things of history is what happens if this class had started construction earlier. Because again, because the Austrians structure themselves and don't extend themselves, what they want to build, they can actually build fairly efficiently. And thanks again to things like the Skoda works and other works, you know, again, the Austrians have a very well-developed armaments industry, a very well-developed armor industry, a very well-developed, for their size, everything they need, and exporting potential. So they are more than capable of building these ships. If, therefore... Well, if uh, House had followed the same policy of Monteculi and had circumvented the government and just started the funding and started the procurement with the permission of, of course, the Emperor, they could have been started a lot earlier. It's potential that they could have been started in 1913. They were down to be started in 1914, once the appro approval had gone through. And if we consider again, compared to the Tegatovs, if they'd been started in 1913, and that is the strong possibility, that's when they would have been started in 1913, the Tegadoffs were commissioned in, well, started in 1910 and commissioned in 1912. In terms of uh, Verbrius uh, Unitus, Tegadoff herself is 1910, commissioned in 1913. You're talking two to three years to build the ships. Yes, war breaks out, but if they'd already been started well before the war had begun and were most of the way to being completed, they might well have been finished off, rather like Svant Istvan was. In which case, the Austro-Hungarians could have found themselves with 
four Tegadoths and two as uh, monarchs as their battle as their battle fleet. If we consider how much force was sent to the Mediterranean in order to cater for the potential threat of three of the Tegatovs. Because so Nistvan doesn't come into service till 1915. Six. Six such large capital units. Ooh, that would have had a big effect. Because again, you need to guarantee you can counter those six at all times. Because the Austrians could pick when they came out. Whereas the French, the Italians and the British couldn't. They'd have to be ready at all times for them to come. But House was not Monteculli. And there's also the fact that this class, the Erzat Monarchs, were going to be expensive. Um, the previous battleships had cost. 18, 26, 40, 60 million kronen individually. The Tegatovs have been the 60 million. Now, yes, there's inflation, but there's also the fact that the complexity and size of these ships had grown dramatically. Put another way, these ships, if they cost an average of 82 million kronen, would cost a total of 328 million kronen. Which is more than the first three, i.e. the Habsburgs, Erzak, Karls, and Razetsky's classes, all their procurement put together. That's cost inflation. Now, you can see, when you look around the ship, there is a lot of guns. There are a lot of small guns everywhere. The Ezzat Monarch class are festooned with them. For dealing with aircraft, for dealing with surface vessels. All the potential threats they could deal with. They also have a lot of firepower. Why does this class have a big effect on the world? Because if this class is being built more quickly and is ahead of time, the Italians will be pushing for their battleships far more. They'll be pushing them through far faster. Now, why does this have an effect? Well, I could see it leading to a scenario where the Italians have a bigger fleet, battle fleet than the French. World War I probably shaped how much they did, but we could well get to a treaty system post-World War II, where the Italians are demanding a larger sh fleet size, a larger all allocation than the French. And that has ripples. Ripples throughout history. The point of history, and one of the really interesting things to consider when we're looking at key ships, is how much of this history is interconnected. That you press down slightly on one lever, in one small lever, in one small corner of the world, and it can have a ripple impact across the whole world. That's one of the reasons why I don't like it when people start just talking about the Anglo-German naval race. Because, yeah, that was the quali uh, quantitative race going on. You know, the you know, sheer amount of who can build the most scenario going on. With the German risk fleet strategy and all those things. But the qualitative race, that's massive. The qualitative race involves 
so many different ships. Because you add in, this gets completed. The Francisco Caracalas are getting completed. So not only will Italy want a larger portion of the a larger allocation on the treaty system, they will have those bigger, faster battleships. They will have the first generation of fast battleships. They were beaten to the first generation of dreadnought battleship. But a 28 knot, 34,000 ton fully loaded, 8 15 inch gun battleship. That is the first generation fast battleship. The world owes a lot of what happened in its 1920s, 30s, and World War II to the fact that this class, Anton House, did not take the same gamble as Monteculi and did not start this class off earlier. He could have at least started one. Could have at least started one. We consider Trieste. The uh, Stelmento Tensiano Trieste could more than likely have started to work on it. They are the ones who built Verbius Unitas, Tekarov, and Prince Jürgen. They could have started work quite happily pushing through their one. Uh, they, were they did have the first two vessels ordered of them anyway. Um, number 8 and number 9 10 and 11 were ordered from uh, Gans Danavius Fiume which had also beat Saint, uh, also built Saint, Is Saint Istvan so they have options these ships could have been built one or two of them and that would have had a massive ripple through history. A massive ripple. It's 10, 14 inch guns. It's 21 knots. It doesn't look anything special, although it's a very well built battleship, it isn't really anything special in terms of the Dreadnoughts of the era, but this ship gets built. One of its class enters service and the likely, the very likely ripples of it would have been still echoing around the world well into the 1950s. This is why when we point to vessels like the South American Dreadnought Race, vessels that, that, go, that go to Brazil, Argentina and Chile, they have an impact. They have a value. Yes, they're a the South American naval race, but they also have an impact back on the major naval race going on and in the qualitative naval race going on. Because every single ship built, every development represents a point of evolution, a point of development, and something, another benchmark for people to compare themselves to. So. With that said, what is today's question? Because I always put a question in every video at the end. And today's question is simple. House gambles. He does a Monteculi. We're going to be very conservative. We're going to say Battleship 8 gets better finished. Battleship 9 gets started. But Battleship 8 
Yeah, it's finished. So, Battleship 8, let's say, gets started in July 1913. Battleship 9 gets started, laid down, in January 1914. So we just can't back those two ships a year. And instead of her being scheduled for being launched on June 1917, they accelerate things a little bit. Just a tad. But when they're making the schedule, it was post the loss of their Archduke. So, um, yeah. So they managed to keep to two, uh, managed to get it all done and get up finished by 19, commissioned by 1916. One of them commissioned by 1916. What do you think happens? Do you agree with me? Do the Italians respond or do they stick their heads in the sand? What do you think happens? I, I I cannot see any scenario where the Italians stick their heads in the sand about it, but I would be really interested to hear your ideas. Thank you very much for watching. What have we got? Uh, ooh, coming up. It's viewers' suggestion on for the year of technology topic. Uh, so far, viewers' suggestions have been Cub Caribou. Uh, what if all the admirals and all Lexingtons were built? Half of them completed as uh, carriers and half as battle cruisers. And viewer suggestion number two was um, learning lessons from war. How navies go about the process of analyzing conflict and learning from it. Hmm. And I'm now busily recording all sorts of videos for uh, covering the first two weeks of September, which is, of course, the birthday bonanza. Not for me. My mum and her twin sister. <laughs> the technical birthday is, of course, as I've said on this channel before, is all the uh, women in my family are 21. I was well trained by my grandfather. They're all 21. That's according to women themselves. I have managed to somehow get older than my mother and my elder sister. But, um... The party is actually, and I kid you not, the invites have gone out again. Have gone out with literally written on them. Come celebrate our 21 again for the 59th time birthday. It's going to be fun. Going to be driving around a lot. Goodness knows all the places I turn up. I will try and do some lives during those couple of weeks, but goodness knows where they'll be from. And um, thank you for watching. Take care, and hope you enjoyed this video. There's no UAD stuff for this one, because... Honestly, I'm probably going to do a UAD video... Ultimate Adult Dreadnoughts, that is. Uh, live on Twitch this evening, while well, this is going out, I'll be doing it, and I was going to try and work out what an Urzat Monarch class would look like and what some likely responses to the Francisco Caracola class might be. Thank you very much for watching, take care, and hope you're having a nice day.